welcome everybody to our uh, deep dive on Russia and hacking and America and everything in between. My name is Julia Yaffe. I'm a staff writer with The Atlantic, where I often write about all things Russia. Uh, sitting next to me is the wonderful ambassador, Michael McFall. Wonderful. I didn't know that. You're wonderful. All right, good. Um, ambassador McFall is a professor at uh, Stanford University and a scholar of revolutions and uh, democracies. He was also the architect of the Obama administration's reset with Russia, reset of American-Russian relations, and he served as the ambassador to Moscow um, from 2012 to 2014, right? Um, and he's a longtime scholar on Russia. So we're going to talk uh, today, we're going to start with the U.S.-Russia relationship. Okay. Um, is it possible uh, for the U.S. and Russia to have a non-contentious um, relationship? Can we be friends rather than frenemies? Uh, yes, because at other times in our history, we've had that kind of relationship, including, by the way, for the first three years that I worked in the government. Um, uh, back then, we cooperated with Russia on all kinds of things that I thought and the President, President Obama thought were important for America's national security interests. Uh, we got a, a major START treaty done. We reduced the level by 30% of nuclear weapons in the world. That's a good thing, right? Uh, so that, you know, yeah, that, that's, a, that's what I did in 2010. What'd you do? Uh, and I haven't done anything important since. But um, uh, we got sanctions on Iran during that period. That was an important thing to get a deal later. We got Russia into the WTO. Uh, we opened up a supply route through Russia so that we could reduce our dependence on Pakistan. Uh, first time that that had happened since World War II, by the way, that American soldiers were flying through Russian territory. That was really important to us so that when we one day violated the sovereignty of Pakistan in 2011 and killed Osama bin Laden, uh, our supply routes were not dependent on that country. And I could go on. There was a long list of cooperative things we did. Uh, by the way, back then, Russians and Americans had a positive view of each other, 60%. And there are earlier periods, too. Go back and look at the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, era and the early, uh, early Yeltsin-Clinton era, where uh, we did cooperative things together based on national interests. So I say that because there is an argument out there that because of our culture and our history and kind of the balance of power in the international system, that we're destined to be uh, conflictual. That's not true. I don't believe that for a minute. I think it has to do with very concrete circumstances and very concrete individuals in terms of why do you get cooperation sometimes and confrontation in other times. So to play devil's advocate um, and to advocate for the Trump administration's uh, uh, position. I heard you do that very effectively yesterday, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> She's really playing devil's advocate now. Why, so why not have a res another reset of relations with Russia right now? Why, right. Not, why can't we just get along with them right now? So, uh, uh, you know, as many of you may know, our, our president is about to have his first meeting with President Putin uh, next week. A uh, very important meeting. And um, I think it's fantastic that they're meeting. Uh, of course, our leader... Uh, our president should always meet with other heads of state, even if they disagree, because there's nothing, and I was in many meetings between Obama and Putin and Obama and President Medvedev, uh, there's nothing like getting the two heads of state together to get a, a real feel for how they're thinking, and so that's a very important thing. So I'm, I'm always for engagement, I'm always for diplomacy. There's nothing worse than having uh, a conflict with a country based on misunderstanding or misinformation, right? That's number one. Number two, I support, I'm a big critic of the president. I have been on many issues, including his foreign policy. So, you know, check me out if you want to know what, what I write about in, in the Washington Post or Twitter. But I want to be clear, I'm always of the school that if we can cooperate with country X, Y, and Z on something that's good for Americans, uh, we should pursue that. We should try to do that. What I'm not for is having a good meeting, or having a good relationship. Uh, and by the way, I would say that about France and, 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 and Britain and Germany, our allies, as much as I would say it about uh, Russia, which is to say the goal of your policy 
can never be just like, oh, you know, we had such a good time. And, and he served me champagne in the Kremlin. He's, he's my really good friend. And I really understand Vladimir. That's not in our interest. Like, what do we get out of that? You know, he get, the president gets a photo op. What do we get that is good for us? In, and I think the president has that kind of backwards, by the way, not just with Russia, but with a lot of countries. The goal should be, you know, how are we going to deal with Syria? What are we going to do with respect to the occupation of Ukraine? How are we going to in, increase trade and investment? That's something he wants to do. And then the means for doing that is either engagement, concessions, or containment or isolation. Those are the means. And right now, it, it appears to me that President Trump has that kind of uh, mixed up, but you know he's got a few more days. Uh, and I hope that when he goes into that meeting, he'll be thinking about what is good for us. Because I can tell you, Vladimir Putin is going into that meeting not just to have a photo opportunity and not just to like, you know, shoot the, uh, are we on the record or off the record? I'm from Montana, it's shoot the shit is what we say in Montana. Uh, um, uh, that's no good, because Putin's coming with very concrete things that he wants. Our president needs to be ready for that. What should uh, the American president come with? What agenda should he come with? What do, what do we want to get out of this meeting, ideally? So if I, if I were writing the talking points, I used mm -hmm. to write those memos, um, uh, I would say two things. One. There is a perception of President Trump that A, he just wants to get along and therefore he's ready to like lift sanctions on, on Russia uh, in the name of a good meeting. I think he has to disabuse uh, President Putin of that right away. He's got to be straight. I'm about, uh, you know, there's sometimes in my world in diplomacy, there's this negativity towards transactional diplomacy. You know, we're supposed to have more loftier uh, diplomacy than that. I, 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 you know, we have a longer debate about that in another day. I'm not against transactions. I'm against one-way transactions. Okay, I'm going to lift sanctions for you. What are you going to do for me? And right, so, so far, he hasn't do that. So that I think he needs to be clear about. We're, we're not in the business of giving concessions in the name of you saying nice things about me, Vladimir. Number two, he has to speak about Russia's violation of our sovereignty in 2016. They violated our sovereignty, folks. The, doing one of the most sacred things we do as a democracy, choosing our president. Uh, the w evidence is overwhelming, and now I think, because the president always changes his mind, but I think even he now has come around to understanding that, and he needs to be clear uh, about, a, that we cannot do that. B, if you do it again, let me tell you a little bit about our capacities, because we have tremendous capacities in that world. Uh, and then three, you know, this is down the road, a more op you know, longer term agenda about some basic rules of the road about what one does and what one doesn't do in the realm of cyber. Not unlike, by the way, what we did with arms control 40 or 50 years ago when nuclear power and nuclear weapons were a new technology and we had to figure out how to manage it so that we didn't blow each other up. We can blow each other up. We can do giant damage to both of our countries right now uh, if we don't have some rules of the road. That's what I would say there. Uh, two, Ukraine. If I were writing the Ten Commandments for how countries should behave in the international system, I think right at the top might be, thou shall not annex the territory of thy neighbor, right? That's a pretty good one to start with. Like that, that's a, that does not help the international system. That makes things a lot harder for cooperation. Uh, and, and, you know, I think he should go in knowing, I mean, and I know the people working with him preparing for this meeting. Um, uh, some of the more outrageous things that I think they should do, I'm not going to talk about. But even within the parameters of the Trump team, uh, I, should, I think he should talk about that. He says, hey, look, I want to lift sanctions. I want to get on with trade and investment, but, it, but we have to have a resolution to Ukraine first. And if you think I'm going to lift sanctions without movement on that, you're wrong. If you've read that, you're wrong. Do um, you want me to keep going? I can go through the whole list. Uh, <laughs> North uh, Korea, Iran. Uh, you haven't uh, mentioned human rights. I haven't mentioned human rights because I don't, I just, uh, let me be blunt. Uh, uh, that's something that you know I care a lot about, I've written about, and we in the Obama administration had a strategy for advancing what we called universal values around the world. We can 
talk about whether we, what we achieved or not. And when my book is out next spring, we can debate it right here. How about that? Um, uh, candidate Trump, President-elect Trump, and with a rare speech that I think was for a domestic cause, not for a cause about values with respect to Cuba, has never talked about democracy and human rights, right? He doesn't. Um, so I don't think he's credible, to be blunt. And for him to, you know, I, I'll tell you what might happen, because this has happened in previous administrations. I've written about Russia. I've seen declassified memcoms from time to time. Here's what might happen. It's in his briefing, mm -hmm. and it says, before you get up from the meeting, utter the word human rights, so that the briefer, the senior administration official that would read it out to the press, I used to do that. SAOs, we used to call them at the White House. We, I could then come out to deal with people like you and to say, oh, Julia, or I like to call her Julia. Uh, Julia, oh, we talked about human rights. The president mentioned human rights, right? He said human rights as he's, human rights. You, you think it's a, th so you just that, go, human rights. Yeah, and, and that, <laughs> that, that I think uh, does not serve America's national interest. Now, I want to be clear. I think Donald, President Trump is wrong, fundamentally wrong, to not talk about democracy and human rights. A, because of the values that, that I believe strongly, but B, because I believe it's in America's national interest. But I don't think between that... You know, and, and believe me, I got a whole speech on that if, if uh, Julia would let me do it. But I just don't, I don't think between now and his meeting with Putin that he's going to be convinced of that. So I, I just see it as a kind of cynical thing. Okay. Uh, and before we look back at the history of the U.S.-Russia relationship, I wanted to ask you about the violation of America's sovereignty in 2016 because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what happened, what didn't happen. So as far as you understand it and you understand the facts, what happened in 2016? So um, in 2016, uh, Russia, like all countries do, uh, was gathering intelligence about our presidential election, both through human ways and uh, virtual ways, right? Um, uh, by the way, we, the United States of America, does that all the time as well. Uh, I, as the US ambassador, that was one of my assignments, was to gather information about the country uh, and then explain it back to my leadership back at the White House and State Department. Um, but then they did something much different than that. They stole the data and they published the data to influence the outcome of the election. That, I think, is not debatable. That, those are facts. I, I, that is not an opinion. That, those are facts. What, what is more, there's a hard social science question and then a hard opinion question. The hard social science question that people like, you know, we have a team at Stanford looking at this. What was the causal impact of that activity, right? Uh, that's a really hard question to, to isolate the independent effect of the WikiLeaks data dump uh, on the elections. And we could debate that if you're interested. I think it's hard. I, I would just note that most certainly uh, candidate Trump thought it was very important, so important that he mentioned it all the time. Uh, and, and I know that the other ca the candidate uh, and her team believe that it did damage to them, especially with mobilizing their electoral base, especially with those that were kind of on the fence that then decided I'm not going to turn out because you know, crooked Hillary emails and that narrative, that's pretty clear. What the exact impact of WikiLeaks was not there. But that was their intentions, folks. So they did that. Whether or not they succeeded or not, that's a, that's a more academic question, but that was their intention. Second, they also tried to impact on the media debate uh, about our presidential elections. Um, so just to be very concrete about it, there's something called Sputnik, 100% run by the Russian government. Uh, has an actor, it's, it's like AP, but for the Russian government. Uh, they tweeted one time, hashtag Crooked Hillary, right? So, so remember, we have laws in our country that doesn't allow a Russian citizen to give money directly to Donald Trump, but somehow it's okay for the Russian government to give in-kind campaign assistance, hashtag Crooked Hillary. Uh, and, and, you know, on in the internets with bots, all that stuff. That they did that. They had a strategy to try to be engaged in it. Now again, the, the social science question, did any of that have an independent causal impact 
on the presidential election? Again, very hard question. We're digging at it. Uh, my guess is probably not. But did they try to do that? The, the answer to that is absolutely yes. So I'm going to ask you the question that I always get tortured with on TV, and I'm sure you do too. What does Vladimir Putin want? And what did he want in, the, in this case in 2016? Did he just want to help Trump? Did he want to hurt Hillary Clinton, whom you served under? Those two are two sides of the same coin, right? Hurt Trump, hurt, hurt Clinton, help Trump. Because I hear people make that argument. Oh, he just wanted to hurt Hillary. He didn't want to help Trump. <laughs> Where does that happen? Uh, we only have two candidates in our system, folks. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. And, and, and why did he want to hurt Hillary Clinton? Yeah, so I, I didn't uh, purposely uh, say what they did with the Trump campaign, right? Maybe we'll get into that in questions. Um, uh, I, you know, I've, I've obviously been following this very closely. Uh, like That's I'm a sure, cute folks. Somebody should ask. Yeah, them. right. But but that part is still in terms of fact. Because you asked me what we know. We still don't know exactly what happened. And that's why you know, we need the commissions. That's why we need the FBI investigation. I strongly believe that won't be enough. And I have been advocating for over a year now, first with the Obama administration. It came out in a, a big Washington Post piece that they considered it. Uh, but we need a, a September 11th-like independent commission. I, I strongly believe that. But because we don't know. We don't know. And we need to know. By the way, we also need to know what our government did and did not do, including my former friends. They're still my friends, but they're former uh, government <laughs> officials. I think they're still my friends. Um, uh, but, but even like, you know, like weird things like the FBI interaction with the DNC. Uh, I've dealt with, I've been attacked on, uh, by the Russians. I've had the FBI show up at my house when I worked in the government, you know, on a Saturday morning in Chevy Chase because that, that we were so concerned about it. I was just a mid-level official at the White House. Why wasn't that kind of interaction happening there? So I think there's a lot, lot, in order to make us safer for the future, we have to know what happened and then have the prescriptions. And by the way, it's shocking to me that we're now in July. We've done zip, zero, not one thing to prevent this from happening in the future. And I want to remind you all two things that people forget. If you're a Republican and you're happy Trump is president, don't for a minute believe that the next time around that Mr. Putin's going to be on your side. And two, don't think that the Russians are the only actors, folks. There's lots of people interested in disrupting our elections, including like some you know, college kids where I teach. Uh, you know, so we've got to take that seriously, uh, uh, in my view. Um, so but I didn't answer your question. What was what your is, question? What is Vladimir Putin? Oh, Putin, Putin. Oh, that's easy. That I know well. Uh, two th th first Clinton and then the broader thing. Mm. So, um, so uh, it's a long, complicated story but, you know, uh, that you've written about a lot. But remember, back in December 2011, there was a parliamentary election in Russia um, right before the presidential election that re-elected uh, President Putin as, uh, in the spring. And he had already declared his candidacy before that election. That election was falsified at kind of the, no disrespect to my Russian colleagues here, but we met on it, you know, we met at the White House, we got all our team together, we got the IC together, the intelligence community, and we looked at the levels of falsi falsification. And, you know, uh, there was a common held view that it was just kind of normal. Like, it wasn't too big a thing not to, you know, the, there's falsification around the world. But a bunch of Russians, a bunch of Russians, uh, uh, A, because of technology, could document that falsification and move that information around in a faster way. And B, didn't want to just like, oh, falsification, no big deal. Let's just move on to the next thing. And so they went out and they protested, as you know well, and you were there and, and wrote about it. Um, we then had to debate what to say about that. We, the Obama administration, and I was part of that. Uh, and we put out a statement in the name of Secretary Clinton. Uh, I was the one that cleared it from the White House. Um, and uh, I thought it was a pretty innocuous statement at the time, I'll tell you honestly. Uh, um, uh, basically saying, we don't like it when countries uh, falsify their elections, right? That's, it was way more diplomatic than what I just said, uh, but that's what we said. Um, uh, and Putin was really pissed, really, uh, really upset with that statement. Uh, we heard it from him from the highest levels, and later he said publicly that Hillary Clinton said a 
sent a signal to the Russians to go out and protest. And I then landed as ambassador uh, to Russia a couple of weeks later, and I was then labeled as the guy sent by President Obama to foment revolution in Russia. That was why I was sent there. And for the How next- did you do? <laughs> How did I do? Uh, uh, that was not my assignment. I want to be clear. Joking, joking. But, but right. Uh, wait, never mind. I'm not going to joke about that. Um, but but the, the point is, is that Putin was incredibly paranoid. Uh, he believes this stuff. Uh, uh, I've sat with him this close. I've listened to him talk about it. It is not just some thing that they throw out there for their electoral base. I used to believe that, I'll tell you honestly. And lots of his colleagues, these are people I've known, some of them for decades, who ran his campaign. They're cynical about it. He's not. He's not cynical about it. Because remember, the last time there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Moscow was 1991, the year the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and so that, for him, became a personal vendetta, him against Clinton. And so when he had the opportunity to strike back, he did. There's just, there's just no doubt in my mind. That doesn't mean that the, ulterior, the other objectives not, 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 might not be part of it. The fact that we're in such disarray right now, that we are so polarized, that we are, are not focused on the outside world, that's all in Putin's interest. He's looking at this and saying, oh, this is great. Oh, my goodness. He fired Comey. Oh, my goodness. This is great. They're fighting amongst themselves. They're not a leader in the world right now. They look like you know, people are even talking about the, the integrity of our, our de democracy. I was just on a panel two hours ago. The future of American democracy. That is music to Putin's ears. Because that is what uh, he, he wants us to be diminished in the world. And in that narrow sense, he is a, so far ha is achieving his objectives. That's right. Um, so let's do a quick look back and a look forward. So how did we get here? How did things get so bad? And what was the breaking point? So again, I want to remind you of that reset period. Perezagruska, for my Russian colleagues. Um, uh, I mean, we were, had a very cooperative, very big agenda. And I would say the height of it, but it was also the downfall, was when we negotiated with President Medvedev to get the Russians to abstain, which do, that means to support, the use of force in Libya. Russia has never done that, nor the Soviet Union. They've never done that. Uh, uh, the idea that the West would intervene militarily in the internal affairs of a country, that was unprecedented. Uh, UN Security Council resolutions 1970 and 73, if you want to look them up. That was a huge victory for us in the White House. I remember it very well. And we were on the, we, it was a mood like, oh my goodness, maybe we can have a genuinely cooperative strategic partnership with Russia. And it felt like that, right? Uh, but then I would say two or three things came together to undermine that. Number one, there was a Russian that actually didn't support that decision. Uh, he was very upset about it, and eventually he went public with it. That was Prime Minister Putin. Uh, he criticized his president, I think, for the first time in, with respect to foreign policy ever, that it, he said, this is wrong. This is not in Russia's national interest. And I don't even exclude, of course, I don't know, but I don't even exclude the possibility that that's when Putin finally said, this Medvedev guy, he's being hoodwinked by these Americans. He's being dragged into these things. I've got to come back. And that's what he decided in September. And then two, three other things happened. I mean, the, the main drama was we were doing our stuff government to government together on all these things I described e er, earlier. And some crazy Democrats got in the way, small d Democrats, uh, in Egypt, in Syria, in Libya, and then in Russia, and later in Ukraine. They weren't part of our agenda, right? They, weren't, they were not taking their signals from us. They didn't care about, the president really wanted a, another uh, arms control agreement in his second term, right? We had a whole game plan, a whole thing to r run with that. Uh, the protesters in Moscow, they didn't really care about our arms control agreement. Uh, we, had a, we had a plan with Ukraine, uh, how we were going to manage that when uh, Mr. Yanukovych decided that um, he was not going to sign the agreement with the Europeans. 
these crazy Democrats in Ukraine, they, didn't, they weren't read into our plan, right? Uh, and I think the central drama, and Syria as also as part of this, the central substantive drama uh, that led to the decline um, at the end of the Obama administration was this fundamental disagreement about what was happening in these countries. Putin thought that we were fomenting revolution. He thought that we were supporting these, these movements. We, and the president uh, personally, tried to explain that we were reacting to these things. We weren't supporting him, but we could never close the gap over that. And for me, the combination of Putin coming back uh, and those events happening, I mean, we might, we might have made some, uh, there might have been a few things that we could have done differently, tweak in the margins, you know, different little, little things, but that fundamental drama was what ended the cooperative period. So is there anything you could have done differently and anything that the U.S. could have done differently going back to 1991? You know, Russians now say there should have been something like a Marshall Plan to help the former Soviet Union integrate more into the West. There shouldn't have been NATO expansion. Does any of that hold water to you? Yeah. <clears throat> well, back in the 90s, uh, I most certainly was one of those people that made the argument uh, uh, including, you know, with government officials, that we had a national interest and that we in the West had an interest in uh, democracy and markets consolidating in Russia and Russia joining our clubs, our institutions. And, and I, that, there's a normative reason why you might think that's a good reason, but my argument was not about norms. Mine was about interests. Uh, and the metaphor was, uh, you know, the Marshall Plan. Like, like we had these enemies, uh, we use our resources, uh, and, and including occupation, by the way, that's a big difference, uh, that, that brought them into our community of states. Uh, and, you know, there's never been an enemy of the United States has been a democracy, and almost all of our enemies have been autocracies. So just if you look at the sweep of history, that, that logic made sense. Uh, I mean, the explanation for why we didn't do it is kind of related to lots of panels that we've had here over the last couple of days. You have to remember that that was the end of history moment, right? Uh, end of history is an article that my colleague Frank Fukuyama from Stanford wrote back then. And that's because we thought, oh, it's all, it's all going to happen. You know, there's no alternative to democracy and markets. So uh, history's on our side. It'll all just work out. We don't have to invest in it. Uh, they'll figure it out because what is the alternative? That was the mood. And second, there was no, you know, what, what Russia really could have benefited from was a, a, a really threatening China back in 1991, you know, uh, because that's what, that's what Germany and Japan, Japan benefited from. They benefited from this threat that was the Soviet Union, and that caused us to invest. So my view is we, we should have done more. But I, I think it's too easy to blame it on that. I think there were other opportunities uh, closer in history. On NATO expansion, for instance, whether that was good or bad, we could, we could debate in the 90s. I ultimately think it was the right decision, but we put to bed NATO expansion during the Obama era. That was, I, I was at every meeting with Putin and Medvedev for five years with the president. Not once did NATO expansion come up as a big conflict. That is all post facto. That's all post Ukraine. That is all revisionist history. Propaganda, if I dare say, because I've, I've watched a lot of Russian, uh, probably a lot, well, there's some people in the room who watch more Russian television than I, but that's all, you know, and that reminds me of a lot of conflicts, right? Everything's peaceful, everything's fine. Suddenly there's a conflict, and then we got to go back to the 13th century to explain it, right? Uh, that was not the way it felt. In fact, if you don't believe me, here's a challenge to you. Go read President Medvedev's speech at the NATO summit in Portugal, 2010. I was there with him. Uh, think about how crazy this was. We were talking somewhat in public and even more ambitiously behind closed doors of building missile defenses cooperatively with the Russians. Think about how crazy that sounds. That was only five years ago. And in that speech that he gives publicly, uh, he says the Cold War is over. There's no need for NATO and Russia. We're not in a conflictual relationship. And by the way, RT, you, you, there are people who were talking about RT earlier. 
on a panel that I was at, Russia Today. Uh, I, I saved it because I like to remind people of this. RT was saying the same thing because that's where propaganda was at that time. They were, they were highlighting what a tremendous breakthrough that their leader had done at this NATO summit to finally put to bed this conflict. So, so something more proximate has to be the explanation. You, it's not NATO expansion. All right, thank you so much. We're going to go I to now get next. retired. Okay. No, All right. No, we thank have you. to go to our next. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. So, uh, joining us on stage now are two phenomenal Russian journalists. We often talk about Russia, but not to the Russians. So, I'm really grateful to the Aspen Institute for making this happen and bringing Galina and Alexei to talk to us. We did a great panel this morning about um, life as journalists in. Um, Putin's Russia. So to my left is Galina Timchenko, who is the head of Medusa, which is a Russian language news site run out of Latvia, so the EU, and uh, away from the prying hands of Vladimir Putin. Before that, she was the editor of Lenta.ru, which was the most popular news website in Russia until in 2014. Uh, there was basically a politically motivated hostile takeover. Galina was forced out, and the whole, basically the whole editorial team walked out with her. Uh, and to Galina's left is Alexei Kovalev, who uh, runs a project called the Noodle Remover, which comes from a Russian, a Russian saying for, a Russian metaphor for misleading somebody, which is to hang noodles on their ears. So, um, very colorful language. So Alexei's project is designed to stop, uh, to debunk fake news in the Russian media. He's also a journalist at the English language Moscow Times, and before that he worked at the state-run RIA Novosti, uh, running a project that translated uh, foreign news into Russian for Russian consumption. So let's talk about the propaganda aspect of it. I think this is a question that uh, bothers a lot of Americans. Fake news, Russian propaganda, RT. What are we... First of all, talk about your experiences with it. You've been dealing with it, as you said this morning, this was you, since before it was fashionable inside <laughs> Russia, right? Yeah. Uh, as one of our colleagues, uh, Max Trudalyubov, said, a lot of what happened post-2014 was uh, Vladimir Putin taking his domestic tactics international. Absolutely. So talk about you your experience. Know, you know, uh, uh, speaking about uh, Russian propaganda and Vladimir Putin uh, strategy, I want to say that Unfortunately, he is extremely successful. Uh, um, you know, um, the, main, the main goal, the main target of Putin is to spread panic and to make you nervous. You know, all about Russia, uh, all news about Russia make you nervous. And he looks like the most uh, influential man in the world. But frankly, uh, if you uh, take a look to this latest uh, so-called direct line with Russian people. Explain, you, explain what that is. It's a special TV show when uh, some people from all over the Russia asking questions to their president and he answers in the uh, answers online through all TV stations. Uh, That's four so, hours. Uh, four, four hours. It's yeah, the people it's, calling it's their star. Yeah, it sounds insane. It's something like Fidel Castro did. Six hours of speaking, wow. Uh, so, and when, when you, uh, uh, if you take a look to this direct line with Russian people, what, uh, what could you see? You can see the older and very, very tired man who does not care at all at, at all problems. So, Putin is very influential, but let's say collective Putin, because Putin is not alone. He is more than, he, he uh, more or less uh, has Silovics, he has FSB, special forces, his new Russian guardians, Rosgvardia, it's the special National forces. Guard, the Russian uh, National yeah, Guard. Yeah, it's Russian, Russian Guard. So which has, I'm sorry to interrupt, which has now, is now allowed to shoot into crowds, absolutely. according to Russian law. Um, allowed to shoot into crowd and to beat uh, women, children, and even pregnant women. Uh, they have... Uh, um, under the law. Under this the is, law, yeah. yeah. So, and the main target of uh, Putin, collective Putin, is to spread 
panic and to make you nervous. And he is extremely successful because speaking uh, last session was devoted to populism. And a uh, guy from Germany said, you know, we have Russian uh, speaking population in Germany. It's uh, about million. OK, it's six million, but who cares? Uh, it's uh, six million. And they watching RT. For God's sake, they are watching Russian state federal TV channels via satellites. Uh, they are direct target of Russian state propaganda, not RT. RT is established and devoted to you, not to Russian-speaking uh, um, population uh, in the United States or in Germany. So, uh, in our, uh, I live in Latvia, it's Baltic state, and we have the same problem. Third of our population is Russians. And what did the uh, Latvian government uh, do? They just refused to devote a minute of uh, broadcasting in Russian language. So they leave a third of their population mm -hmm. uh, at the, in the face or behind the, or uh, in the face of Russian propaganda. All Russian population in Baltics, they just turn on satellites and uh, what is, uh, and they watch Russian state TV with all propaganda. So uh, they spread panic and nerves to you through RT or threat of RT, and they spread propaganda to Russian-speaking population inside European Union, inside the United States, inside Israel, inside any other countries on post-Soviet space. Yeah, in New York, Brighton Beach. Absolutely. Uh, Alexei, you used to work in the same building as RT. Can you tell us how it works? And, uh, yes. And, uh, and are any misconceptions we might yes, have about and I'm going to be the devil's, the devil's advocate here, Julia. Go for uh, it. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to pour some cold water on the uh, massively oversized role that RT is uh, allegedly playing in American politics. Uh, just please raise, raise your hands if you regularly watch RT. <laughs> Okay. One, two, <laughs> three, got point, you. <laughs> you see my point? Uh, uh, RT, yeah, uh, but the thing is that RT, RT's core audience in the States is so small that it doesn't even register on Nielsen's ratings. Uh, and uh, in other ma major TV markets across the Western world where it does, it ranks so low that uh, uh, in the UK, for example, its market share is... 0.5%. Uh, so it's laughably small. It's, it's extremely inefficient as a propaganda vehicle. Uh, just far too few, uh, few people regularly watch it to be, uh, to be of any significant influence. Of course, you can make the argument that uh, it's the retranslators, it's the amplifiers, or whatever you call them, like people on Twitter who you know, spread the message around and uh, repost RT's articles, like Infowars regularly does that. Uh, but if you look at RT's coverage, uh, you'll find that more often than not, that the, the, the dynamic is reversed in, in the way that RT recycles Breitbart, not the other way around. Uh, and also, <laughs> well, knowing this uh, establishment from the inside, I would really like to advise uh, you all to be chill. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> it's 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 really you know you know uh, uh, the DNI report that uh, the public part of which is dedicated, uh, literally one. Uh, Alexei is referring to the declassified portion of the intelligence report that came out in January 2017, dedicated to explaining what happened in terms of Russian meddling, and it had a whole annex. Um, about RT and its influence and its YouTube views and stories that were negative about Hillary Clinton versus positive about Trump, etc. Sorry, go you ahead. Know, you, know, you know the metric of success that RT uses? It's not uh, uh, YouTube views, it's not the TV ratings because they don't have any. It's how many articles are written about RT because the, the editor-in-chief re religiously collects clippings of articles from the Atlantic and the New York Times. Uh, about RT, and then, then they present them at the bu budget hearings at the Russian Ministry of Finance. Like, you see, we are influential. <laughs> you have to give us more money. Uh, so the, 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 this is how it uh, works. It seems to me, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that uh, the influence of RT uh, uh, is overestimated. Yeah. But 
the influence of Russian hackers or Russian cyber army are underestimated. This is the because, difference. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, you know, um, some time, uh, some months ago, we published an article uh, about a guy who was hired by a Russian state company called Rostech as a tester for super, super complex for DDoS attack. And he was, uh, he has an evidence and he, he uh, do, did it by himself. He put on pressure by DDoS attack the, minis, the site of Minister of Defense of Ukraine and crashed, uh, crashed it. So, you know, uh, Russia for real has cyber army. Russia for real has not fabrics of trolls, but uh, cities of trolls. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Russia for sure is deeply involved in election process in the United States. But I insist that the main target is to spread panic, just to show that Russia is the strongest, the <laughs> smartest, and the, um, the most influential uh, um, power in the world, just to, to show our American, see what we can do with you. Mm -hmm. And that's the music for Putin's ears, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, but actually, a lot of uh, work is being done by sp of spreading panic and fear. Uh, you know, uh, RT doesn't have to do that because uh, uh, they have CNN. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but Atlant the, the Atlantic. <laughs> to, to, to do the yeah, you know, it's uh, the, the best Putin, Putin's uh, way of doing and way of thinking. It's his pattern. Uh, you know. Uh, more than 10 years ago, he just catched uh, Russian oligarch Mikhail Khodorkovsky and he put him behind bars on trial and Khodorkovsky gave, uh, get a 12-year sentence and uh, it was atmosphere of uh, fear all over Russian oligarchs and uh, big business. Then after uh, his election in uh, 2012, he said, uh, May I quote him? Uh, he said, "You, sorry, you screw up my my inauguration. I'll screw up your lives." And he put behind bars more than 100 people just for peaceful protest and spread the fear. And now in uh, international. Uh, um, arena. He he makes the same thing. He just put RT and Russian cyber army. Said, "Are you fear enough? Or I'll show you what does fear mean." Well, it's 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 in some ways the definition of asymmetrical warfare, right? You you do a lot with a little. You don't have to be. You don't have to roll your tanks across all of Eastern Absolutely. Europe. Yeah. Yeah. You just do a little bit and say, you know. It's a nice democracy you have. Be a shame if anything happened to it, you know, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's just yeah. it's 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 uh, spreading fear by implication. Yeah, and he he's good poker player, because he raises stakes every time with a poker face, and it's frankly it's scary. So um, let's talk about the the hackers some more and the trolls, which again we all had a lot of. Um, intimate experience with before they crossed the Atlantic to the US. Um, let's talk about the Russian troll factories and how they behave online and these bots. Uh, okay, so th there are two uh, different and uh, barely overlapping uh, subjects. The, uh, the uh, troll attacks aimed at the, at the US mm -hmm. uh, and the trolling inside Russia itself. So which, which one are we talking about? Uh, do a little bit about uh, because Adrian Chen did an excellent investigation into the Russian uh, troll army, uh, where he traveled to Saint Petersburg, where the uh, where this uh, office is, is is physically located, and he confronted these people, and then they tried to they, they in, in, entrapped him and tried to smear him as a uh, as an American spy uh, who came to conspire with the Russian Nazis and that sort of thing. But uh, he has a list, he has a watch list of those tr troll accounts, uh, and he says that they've mostly been dormant uh, during the election. And in, the, uh, in a recent BuzzFeed article, they interviewed uh, uh, the owner of the largest uh, boat network on Twitter, like one of the largest boat network on Twitter, pro like uh, 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 vitriolic uh, pro-Trump retweets, that sort of thing, hundreds and thousands of accounts. And the owner just happened to be an American IT engineer who's pro-Hillary and was doing this for the kicks. 
<laughs> what? Yeah, because it's, because it's fun. I mean, yeah. uh, trolling people online is fun. <laughs> it brings you instant gratification. Uh, but the way it, it works in Russia, yeah, I have... Uh, uh, it's been mostly on the back burner uh, for, for the past couple of years, but the uh, 2014 and 15 were crazy on Russian Twitter. Uh, they, there were hundreds and thousands of, uh, of, the, of these egghead accounts uh, hounding you uh, constantly. Uh, but the thing is that, um, you know, when, you talk, when you're talking about the, uh, uh, the influence of Russian propaganda, uh, that would have been the same people I've been researching for years. And uh, the thing is that <clears throat> they only are effective as long as they are uh, uh, attacking Russian speakers on Twitter. Because th then, th then they can be convincing enough. Uh, then you can, uh, uh, th then you can uh, 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 quite plausibly pretend to be a, uh, a genuine person. But, you know... <laughs> There aren't, there aren't that many people in Russia uh, who are fluent in English enough to you know, pass for a native uh, English speaker on Twitter. And when they do try, uh, it's, it's, it's laughably ineffective because, well, uh, uh, you can immediately see that English is not a native language for, for, for people attacking you on Twitter. Uh, so um, I wouldn't say that uh, the, the, the troll operation... Uh, uh, was uh, of any particular significance? Uh... Uh, you know, uh, I can only say uh, from the side of media that we uh, have, um, it seems to me, a brilliant uh, weapon against trolls. Uh, we have uh, those uh, chats after, after all our articles to discuss the topic. And these charts, uh, these chats uh, is burned uh, after uh, six or ten hours, and there is no like sense. The, com the yeah. comment section, the comment section just disappeared after six or ten uh, hours uh, of uh, publishing this article because new uh, news article leaves for maybe sixteen from twelve to twenty four hours. There is no um, no point to discuss it for days. So we open uh, this. Uh, opinion section and uh, discussion section for six or eight hours and then it's just disappeared and there is no benefit for trolls they could not uh, say you see we published uh, uh, lots of comments and they began uh, the, 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 there is scandal again around it so yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I'll, I'll give you an example of how uh, Russian trolling operation works inside Russia domestically. Uh, so we have a domestic search engine, uh, Yandex, uh, that is far more popular domestically than Google in Russia. Uh, and on top of it, there are like uh, f uh, five uh, headlines, the top, the top breaking stories. And this is the most precious coveted real estate in the Russian media. Uh, and obviously, it's a, hu it's a huge interest to the, for, for the government, uh, because it obviously wants to push its agenda uh, to the top. But Yandex is a private company, and they've been fighting off these att attempts to uh, coerce them uh, or to corrupt them into displaying the government's agenda. Uh, so in the end, they did, uh, uh, they did finally hack the Yandex, Yandex algorithm, uh, but it only works if you can register 127 identical news websites and then have all of them on command fire off an identical article, uh, uh, some, a bland statement, it can be whatever. So that, yeah, because the Yandex algorithm doesn't, doesn't differentiate between, uh, you know, the, uh, the provenance of these news websites. It doesn't know if it's a government-owned website or not. So it pushes it to the top, out drowning all the critical voices. So this is how it works. So it, it, it is a bot network where each bot is a separate newspaper registered with the Russian Ministry of Communications. Uh, unless they can do that here, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, it, it can be effective here as well. So let me ask you, how is, um, how is all of this being seen in Russia? The allegations that the Kremlin hacked the 2016 election, the allegations of collusion between Trump and, uh, and the Russians, or the Trump campaign and the Russians, how is this seen by Russians, by you? As Russians, Alexander. okay, uh, it's my favorite subject because I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm professionally watching Russian propaganda. Uh, so we have these. Uh, the, it's a bit schizophrenic because obviously every Russian uh, official 
uh, is denying any allegations, the so-called allegations of Russian interference in US elections. But on the other hand, uh, uh, they, uh, they really want to, uh, uh, to brag about it. Like we are, uh, yes, we can really influence American elections, but we cannot, we cannot say it out loud that we did, and we have to deny it publicly. But at the same time, we want to be proud that we, 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 we can pull something like this off, <laughs> like hacking the American elections. And you can see there's a lot of, uh, that's, it's a subject of many uh, jokes and, uh, on Russian, uh, uh, stand-up comedy on Russian TV about the Russian hackers, and you can see the editorial cartoons, you know, lampooning the whole thing. But at the same time, uh, you know, the same TV pundits want to brag about it, like, yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, from uh, from my uh, my point of view, it was a very funny uh, show because previously, uh, usual Russian propaganda said that Obama is in charge of all our problems. And there were a lot of jokes that if you see garbage on the street, it's Obama dropped this garbage. We had that here if too. You, we yeah. had that here if too. you have uh, smashed windows, it's Obama. And uh, all Russian TV, uh, they were waiting for election of Donald Trump, and then they praised his victory. And after that, there were a lot of jokes. So we still have garbage. We still have uh, broken windows. <laughs> Is it Donald Trump? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it, it was it was funny to see that. Uh, okay, so uh, Russia is, uh, Russian policy is very reactive. Uh, so, in response to uh, uh, to the American investigation of, Rus of Russian interference in, in, in the American elections, the Russian Senate uh, they just set up a committee uh, for the promotion of uh, sovereignty and the prevention of uh, intervention in Russian domestic affairs as a response. So what, what, do, you think, what, what do you think they're going to do? Do you think they're going to expel the uh, or, or uh, 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 PND, uh, an American diplomat? No, they're going to, in retaliation... Well, they did that to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the only one. Uh, so what are, they, what are they planning to do is to punish Russian citizens for the American investigation uh, into Russian uh, Punish help, like punish the media, you guys? Uh, yes, so they, they are drafting a legislation that would uh, effectively ban uh, foreign uh, news outlets broadcasting in Russian. Uh, because... Uh, Which is what Galina's outlet. Uh, yeah, yeah, they want to put copyright on Russian language. Yeah. So they, 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 they like, just, just, like, just like they did with the anti-adoption law, they punished Russians uh, for uh, for a beef they had with Americans, so they they are in effect holding uh, their own citizens hostage, uh, so that uh, uh, well that's, that they, I, that's a, they, they're going yeah, doing the yeah, same thing. You here. know, maybe the last thing I want to say uh, that uh, f uh, as far as I can understand, uh, um, Kremlin and Kremlin administration they are unfortunately or fortunately for us they are bad in strategy. They are very good in tactics, but they are bad strate strategists. Yeah, exploiting, opportun exploiting opportunities and weaknesses, yeah, that's, yeah, the, that's yeah. the, the best thing they can do. So um, how do you think, how do most Russians see President Trump? How do you think the Kremlin views him? They did some quantitative research at the, one of Russia's uh, news agencies uh, at some point in January, yeah. Uh, and in January, Donald Trump officially overcame Vladimir Putin as the most popular person in Russia. Right, which is, and after that, after that, uh, uh, so the, the, it's, it's because of Melania. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then after that, an, an order came down from the Kremlin saying, okay, that's enough TV, stop mentioning Trump so much because he became more, yeah. more cited than Putin, which is a problem because Putin wants to be the most popular guy. Okay. Um, a quick anecdote, if I may. Uh, Okay, so uh, if, if you watch the Russian TV coverage of the American elections in, in the run-up to the elections, it was crazy. There was no other, literally, there was no, no other country in the world that was so sympathetic to, uh, to Donald Trump. Uh, but uh, it, really, it, it really caused a lot of anger, even in the loyalist circles in, in, in Russia, because people are complaining, why do we keep hearing about this Donald Trump? I literally, I was watching this, I was watching TV, uh, and they would spend more time covering the American elections uh, that they would uh, sp more air time than they would dedicate to the Russian domestic election to the Russian in September 2016. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so they, they literally spend 10 minutes 
discussing on air whether Donald Trump is going to, was going to be assassinated by the FBI for his principal position in Russia. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It's Russian TV. Yeah, the but people are, people are complaining. Newspaper. And one of my favorite uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stories is how uh, one of the most toxic and uh, pro-Putin pundits on, on TV was confronted by an even more ultra-loyalist uh, uh, patriots at the doorstep of, of his TV studio accusing him of Trumpomania. Uh, uh, because, uh, yes, because it, it, was, it was getting really absurd, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the phoning coverage of Donald Trump, uh, you know, in favor of all the Russian domestic, ma domestic matters. And yes, this, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is really, as, as far as I heard from the inside, uh, the, they are very, you know, the Kremlin's media managers are, quite unhappy with the way it you know, it, uh, you know Putin uh, uh, likes to play a game uh, uh, which once uh, described you are tough and you and I am tough but who will write whose epitaph <laughs> you know and he played this game with Erdogan mm -hmm. and now he's going to play this game of tough guys with Donald Trump so let's see interesting who do you think will win in that matchup mm. um uh, I just saw I had... Wait, uh, no, quickly. Who do you think will win in that matchup? Um, uh, you know, who's going to write whose epitaph? Uh, I'm just going to give you a headline from the uh, Russian media I just read. Uh, Kremlin says they will do their best to accommodate the Trump-Putin meeting into Vladimir Putin's extremely uh, busy schedule on G at G20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if, you, if you put uh, a bull uh, against alligator... I'll bet delegator will win. <laughs> yeah. Let's put him. Okay. You know, whoever wins, we're, he's, we're he's losing. Cold-blooded. Yeah. yeah. Cold-blooded uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, uh, wins every time. All right. Doesn't matter which which one of them wins. We're losing. We're yeah. the losers here. We are the losers. Yeah. On Who's that one, on that cheerful note, <laughs> we're going to switch the panel again. Thank you, guys. We are really lucky to have Senator Mark Warner with us. He. Oh. Uh, as you may know, he is the ranking Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which has been front and center for a lot of this, um, you know, must-see must TV uh, drama in recent months. Formerly the governor of Virginia, successful tech entrepreneur. But, but let's, talk about, let's talk about Russia. So um, where do you see this investigation going? You're, you're, well, let, me, uh, sorry, go well, let me go ahead and step back for a moment. I'm going to agree with the journalist and disagree with the journalist, and I'm going to agree with the ambassador and disagree with the ambassador. Let me go through a couple of comments. One, I, in a perfect world, I 100% agree an independent commission would be the right way to do this. But think about what it takes to get an independent commission. The House would have to pass it. The Senate would have to pass it. The President would have to sign it. And any independent commission would have a number of members appointed by the House, a number of members appointed by the Senate, a number of members appointed by the President. Do you think this President is going to appoint independent members? Do you think either one of the political parties would choose anyone other than their most partisan advocates? So, for better or for worse, the Senate Intelligence Committee, which has a record of being relatively bipartisan, and which also has the trust of the intelligence community, and the ratio is eight to seven, and 90% of our votes are not partisan, I believe is pretty much the best we got at this point, number one. Number two, let me, no, no, this is, this is it, I, in many ways, it, this is not a joking matter. I mean, this, is, this, is, this was a full-on attack on our democratic process. And let me step back again and go through three things that we know happened. First, the Russians, in a very sophisticated, organized way, hacked in to both political parties. And midsummer, mid late spring 06, midsummer, decided, interestingly enough, about the same time that the Republican platform changed from in a very much more anti Ukraine, indirectly pro Russian way to start releasing information that would definitely help one candidate, 
Trump and hurt the other candidate, Clinton, to the point and in a way that was so sophisticated that I believe the day was October 7th, October 6th, the day the tape came out about Donald Trump and his attitude towards women, the so-called Hollywood access tape. Within two hours of that release of information was the first release of a John Podesta email. Think about it for them. That's a level of sophistication that you know, we've never seen before. I mean, both countries spy on each other. That has gone on. Both countries, at one point or another, have tried to intervene a little bit. But this is at a level unprecedented. Second, the very technology that we have all become dependent upon in this asymmetrical kind of warfare means that actually we are more vulnerable in many ways than the Russians. And what we saw, and while there may not be that many Russian trolls who are, who are fluent in English, there were enough that could create enough fake accounts that were bots that at least has been reported, and we've not, we've not ver ver verified this, but it has been reported, and a couple of things we have verified, that in the last week of the campaign, strangely enough, in places like Wisconsin, where the Democrats were too asleep at the wheel to know that was even in play, if you were an African-American mom, you got only things on your Twitter or Facebook newsfeed that said Hillary Clinton thinks all young black men are predators. You didn't get the current back and forth between Trump and Clinton. Matter of fact, if you then, uh, at the point where well, they didn't have that much influence, if you had Googled election hacking around the time of the election, for the first five stories, the stories wouldn't be Fox News, ABC, MSNBC. Four of the five stories that came up were RT News, Sputnik, or pro-Russian advocacy stories. That's on Google. Facebook and Twitter, you know, and these are all companies, and this, this, is, this is a big policy issue. We need, to, we're going to have to rethink the role of these platform companies who up to this point have said they have no responsibility at all to curate any of the information that comes across them. Now, we're, I think we have to rethink that because we had a testimony this week from um, NATO has set up an effort to try to look at this, saying that literally 8% of all the Twitter accounts are fake accounts that are used to um, disseminate false information. Facebook, which at the time of the election, and when we were kind of, they were all, you know, they'd never seen this kind of activity. They'd seen child pornography, they'd seen terrorism, they'd never seen this surge of fake news. Facebook, who at first refused to even acknowledge any responsibility, and that's November of 16, by the spring, by the time the French elections came along, they took down 30,000, I want to come back to what's happened in Europe, they took down 30,000 fake accounts right before the Russians dumped all of the emails about Macron in that uh, 48 hours before the election. So the second point is not only hacking and then selective use of information, but using the very tools that we and our kids even more completely depend upon to get their news use this in a way to manipulate, and we don't know the results, but in a way that was pretty sophisticated, and to a certain degree, we've got to finish checking this out, if they were able to do it on a geographic basis, and there were reports of doing this in Wisconsin, and Michigan, in parts of Pennsylvania, a, a white woman would get a stories about Hillary being sick, or Hillary stealing money from the State Department in that last week. How did they know, and how do they have that level of sophistication? At the, let, me, let me just mm -hmm. kind of finish a couple more points here. <laughs> I am a senator. I get to yak a lot. Um, <laughs> but the, the interesting thing as well is the Russian, and I completely agree, the Russian goal, and Putin is not a Republican or a Democrat. He's pro-Russia. The Russian goal was to spread chaos and lack of trust in our electoral process. It was curious that then-candidate Trump, up until Election Day, was saying, you know what, these U.S. elections might be rigged. We have never had a presidential candidate distrust our electoral process. The third point we know as well is not in a way that changed vote totals, but 21 states 
had their electoral system at least scanned, or in certain cases like Illinois and Arizona, hacked into. It didn't affect any voting choice. But that was trying at this point, and one of the things we're trying to get now is DHS to make sure that we make some of that public. We're not made safer by not knowing many of the states who are hacked don't even know they were hacked because they may have contacted simply a vendor that ran the voter file, not the Secretary of State. And the thing that is so troubling before we get to the, the investigation is 17 different agencies in the intelligence community in the United States, getting them to agree on anything is virtually impossible. Impossible. They have unanimous view that the Russians did this in a massive intervention. Every expert that has testified before our committee has said absolutely the Russians did it. Every United States senator that I know, Democrat or Republican, agreed the Russians did it. The one individual in Washington that at least until this week when maybe he grudgingly acknowledged that would not acknowledge this is President Trump. Uh, ambassador Burns, Nick Burns, who was a great guy, ambassador, George Bush ambassador in NATO, gave, gave very powerful testimony this week about how irresponsible that is because if the president doesn't acknowledge this, how are we going to prepare for 2018 and 2020? And the last comment before I start taking the questions is, and this is where, where we all need to, re, we, we need to think about this in a, in a very serious way. If you add up all of the costs of what the Russians spent in intervening in the American election, if you add up what they did in the Dutch elections where the Dutch decided to hand count all their ballots because they were afraid there might have been intervention at the voting machines, if you add up what they spent on the French elections and the dump of the emails, and again, I hope we can come back to this because the French media uh, did a, was much more sophisticated than the American media on how to handle this. And if you add up what they will spend on the German elections, where back in 2015 they totally penetrated the Bundestag and got every member of the Bundestag's uh, information. You add all that up and double it, and you've got less than 5% of the cost of a new aircraft carrier. So as we spend 10x what Russia spends on defense, the one thing the Russians did, and then the ambassador I think will validate this, is even when the price of oil, and the Russian economy is so dependent upon the price of oil, fell to those record lows, the one area the Russians did not cut back on in terms of their investment was cyber activities. So, you know, we're cyber misinformation, disinformation is part of the Russian doctrine of war. And one of the remarkable things that we saw, and I, I Others will probably be able to validate this. I, I think it was Hungary or, or Romania. What they did with some parliamentarians, and they've been doing this obviously in the Baltics much longer, but if they break into your personal email, and anybody here at Aspen I know has an absolutely pure you know, record and would never want to have any of your personal emails exposed, but if there's not anything juicy enough in your personal file, what they have been able to do, for example, with one parliamentarian, was they would insert a child pornography file and then call the local police and say, you ought to go check out that legislator. He's got some pretty nasty stuff. So anyone who doesn't realize in the problem we have right now, and then we'll get to the investigation, is that if the president doesn't acknowledge this as a threat, then we don't have a whole of government approach on how we're going to protect ourselves. From our voting systems, to the questions of how we deal with our technology companies, to the notion of fake news, and you know, it, it is a really serious issue. The one thing that is, gives me hope is that uh, at least um, while we feud and fight about a lot of things in the, in the Congress, uh, I don't know virtually any member of the Senate that doesn't feel this is an extraordinarily responsible, extraordinarily important issue that, man, we got to get right. Although you could, you could be mistaken watching some of these hearings when um, certain senators like Senator Cotton um, ask questions, you could be mistaken that they don't, <clears throat> that they actually care about this. I wanted, so a lot of the, a lot of what you said kind of points in a certain direction, um, you know, the big C word. And, for a lot of Russia watchers, the sophistication of this 
uh, attack was a surprise because nobody who knows Russia would imagine that the Russians know what the DNC is and the DCCC is, and that they know which districts in Wisconsin to target and which districts in Pennsylvania would target. So the question is, how did they get so sophisticated all of a sudden, and does that mean they had domestic help? I mean, those are questions that have to be answered. I mean, that's, that's why this investigation, I said this may be the most important thing I, I, I ever will do in my public life. I think when you're think, talking about you know, the integrity of our electoral process, that's the heart of our democracy. You know, if the Russians can cast doubt on, the, on that, then you know, where do we stand on a country that actually needs to get more united rather than divided? And this, these same tactics are being used, and what, is disapp what disappoints me so far, at least, is it seems that our European allies actually are, are getting better prepared. The French media did a much better job, and they have a different kind of rules than our, job, our media at pointing out some of the, the fake news. And I think uh, our friends uh, in the Baltics would say, you know, there's a level of sophistication in other populations where they can see and help spot fake news in Russia. But we have an echo chamber here with Breitbart and some of these others that reinforce the power exponentially of, of, um, of some of these messages. And, and again, let me make clear. This time, it was for Trump. Next time, it could be for... This is not about Democrat-Republican. And I would argue, and I think the ambassador was right, he had a personal animus uh, uh, President Putin has against Clinton, but he also, uh, it's been reported at least, that Putin believed that America was behind the Panama Papers exposure right. to embarrass Russian oligarchs, and that America was behind the exposure of the doping mm -hmm. activities. Uh, I can give you pretty firm assurance that we were not involved in either one. But this is kind of, this is it this also, new asymmetrical. It almost doesn't matter, it. right? It doesn't, yeah. they believe. It doesn't it. matter if that's what he believes. Right. No, no, it doesn't matter whether we did it or not because that's what he believes. Absolutely. Um, so why do you think President Trump has been so reluctant to admit this? Because he's in bed with the Russians? No, or because? I, I don't know. I'm not, you know. My job is not to reach a conclusion until I get all the information, all of the data. But it's, you know, you can't, I would have never imagined when we started this, and we started it before the, the administration um, came into power, that we would have the acting attorney general, Sally Yates, fired because she was trying to point out the challenges with General Flynn. That the national security advisor would be fired because he didn't disclose contacts with the Russians. That the attorney general would have to recuse himself because he didn't explain uh, all his contacts with the Russians. And then the one that, that you know, I thought, again, this administration couldn't, couldn't surprise me, but I was stunned when Jim Comey got fired. And, you know, again, it, it's pretty powerful to see whether you like Comey or dislike Comey. This is a guy who has had an extraordinary career under both parties as a law enforcement official, and that he felt so uncomfortable that the president might, his words when he testified, lie about the conversations they were having, that he felt he had to have a, to memorialize that uh, in memos. I mean, these are extraordinary times. And, you know, for, if some have said, well, you know, one of you say there's a lot of smoke, you know, I didn't expect us to be spending a month on Comey or a number of weeks on the attorney general. Um, what we're trying to do in a methodical way is, you know, get all the documents, and we have yet to even talk to all of the names that have been affiliated with the Trump campaign that have been mentioned that, uh, uh, in terms of contacts with Russians. So we've got more work to do. I'd like to do it quicker. This is so important that we get right, because if at the end of the day, you know, there is no there there, you know, I've got to stand up in front of all the Democrats and, frankly, the whole country and say there's no there there. In, in some ways, I hope and pray that's the case um, because you know, the alternative is so, is so sobering. Yeah. 
what about uh, the committee? How, how bipartisan has it been in its, in its work? Because it, again, from the hearings, there, it seems like some of the other eight members, or the Republican members, don't really want this to go forward. Listen, I think you know, there's enormous pressure on both sides. You do have you know, a large number of Republicans just want, you know, not saying on the committee, just want this to go away. You probably even got a larger number of the Democrats who believe the president's guilty without any, without any evidence yet, other than circumstantial. Our job is to actually get the facts and then share them with you guys. And there is, and I will do whatever it takes to keep this as bipartisan as long as I can, because it does not do the country a damn bit of good if we come up with a Democratic report that says X and a Republican report that says Y. All that does is push, pushes people back into our corners. And this is really a time it's gotta, we gotta work. And I think, you know, for the most part, there are, you know, we got a wide variety of views. You know, I'm really proud of how the community, uh, the committee has worked. I mean, not, not just, you know, I've got a good working relationship with Chairman Burr, but, you know, Susan Collins and Marco Rubio has been standout, Roy Blunt. Um, uh, there's a series, uh, the new senator from Oklahoma has been, uh, um, James has been very good as well. Um, so I think, you know, stay tuned. So from what you've seen so far, what um, measures could you propose to fortify our, our system? I think we need... How do you, I'm sorry, with the added caveat, I mean, if you look at the European system, they are also more, they don't have a First Amendment, they're a little bit more comfortable with regulating speech, so how do you do that without... Great question. I, I think, you know, we've got one of the founders of the internet here, Steve Case, I mean, I think the, internet, I th I think the technology tools we've got really help, but I do think the idea that just as these platform companies, the Google, Facebook, Twitters, and boy oh boy, I can assure you, some of those know more than, about you than US government does. And they're learning more about you each and every day. Um, but I think they're gonna have to play some level of responsible role here, and it gets hard to, hard to sort that out. But they, you know, but they've done it. They've done it before in child pornography. They've done it around terrorism, and the UK now is trying to work with them to kind of up that level of trying to, uh, to at least curate some terrorism. I think we're gonna to have to do that around fake news. That's number one. Number two, all of us are gonna to have to practice better cyber hygiene. If you don't have double authentication on your devices, if you open an email that you don't know where you're coming from, you're crazy. And you know, this is not just national security and you know, the, the level of ransomware attacks. And think again, you know, from our satellites to our military to our electrical grid, because we are so much more technologically advanced, for pennies on the dollars, our adversaries, not just Russia, mm -hmm. you know, can, can use these tools against us. So I think we need to do that. And every one of our electoral systems, and we have a, it's a great, fact that we have a very distributed electoral system in America. But you don't need to change the results in 50 states to change a presidential election. Heck, no, no candidates campaign in 50 states. You could change the electoral results in three counties in three states and completely change a presidential election. So if we don't think through how we are, you know, from firewalls to security measures, doing a better job of protecting that. And I, you know, as a former governor, you know, I, I believe in our system. But boy, oh boy, there's a lot of local registrars around the Commonwealth of Virginia that may not be totally tech savvy. <laughs> not saying in your states. But you know, but this is where DHS, where they finally designated our electoral system critical infrastructure, but designation needs more. We need a whole of government approach on making ourselves better protected. Well, this is also, a, it's also that our system is set up you know, down to its DNA in a way that makes it more vulnerable. I mean, the French don't have Breitbart and Fox, and they have the media blackout law leading into the election, but they also don't have an electoral college. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how, how do you deal with, how do you preserve the kind of complexities and um, weirdnesses of the American system without 
you know, and and I, so I think you know there there bad. are there are best practices. There are this no, notion. I think there are tools that we have to develop. I mean, biggest growth area in, in our whole economy right now is cybersecurity, and part of that ought to be directed at, at our electoral systems. You know, the financial system's done a pretty good job. Our our electric grid, candidly, has not. Our electoral system has not been high on that list, mm -hmm. but it needs to be in light of what happened in 2016. And I got, a, I got state elections in Virginia in 2017. It needs to be higher on the list. Do you, feel, uh, do you feel bipartisan support in the Senate for implementing some of these measures to protect the system? Or is it, you know, it worked for us, so let's leave it alone? No, I, you know, listen, I, I think that um, I don't know any, any of my colleagues uh, that think this was somehow you know, that Putin was doing this because he's pro-Republican. They know this is a national security threat that we gotta take seriously. And it's gonna take ways. Now again, there is a great resistance from some of my folks that anything that interferes with state or election, you know, that's a state responsibility. But I think we can sort that out. What we don't have so far is we don't even have an organized plan. And that just has to be, it just has to be higher on the agenda. So I, I know that the, on the Democratic side, uh, there, has been, there have been some issues on getting, for example, the FBI to co cooperate on the investigation. Uh, the ambassador mentioned the weird role that the FBI played in the DNC hack. Have you run into similar problems, or have they been you know, we, we have, um, we've had some bumps. This has been hard. I mean, the, the, we are, they are sharing with us intelligence that they've never shared before. And you know, and, and we gotta be careful about leaks, we gotta be care careful about sources and methods. People will die if information is released that, that, is, that is fully classified. So there's, there is this constant tension and we've got, you know, Ron Wyden, for example, is probably one of the fiercest advocates for, you know, more openness. And we, we kind of run the gamut on our committee you know, and, and, and we're not, I'm not gonna guarantee you we're gonna get 100% right, but you know, I owe you a, as fully disclosed, fully complete report at the end of this um, so that we all kind of aware of the threat. And we have a different responsibility than what Special Counsel Mueller has got. And you know, and, it, and it's very interesting to see the level of lawyers some of the best lawyers in our country, you know, are, I think for patriotic reasons, are taking time to be part of this investigation and I think he's treating this in a very serious way and again was, was stunned when I heard that there were, um, at least it seemed like there were conversations in the White House about, about potentially firing him. I was stunned when I asked uh, the Attorney General, you know, have you had any conversations in the White House about potentially pardoning people? And I expected an absolute no, and I got a non-answer. Non um, so, you know, I, I, you know it, all the more reason, though, why even if you are the most vehement anti-Trump person, that you got, we got to do this in a bipartisan way. So, but, and yet, it still seems to be such a partisan issue, and all the polling indicates that the, the public, you know, depending on their political tribal affiliation, that's how they see the investigation, that's how they see the, tri uh, the Russian interference. You know, you have um, a, m a majority of the party of Reagan thinking that Russia's, a, you know, a good guy. So how do you, you know, and, wild. and um, so you've said, and you've said this several times in hearing, in your statements before hearings that, uh, you know, Putin is neither a Democrat nor a Republican, but how do you get that message across to Republican voters? Be because given the incentives, the short-term incentives of American politics. Well, the way you do it is, I think the way you do it is you play it straight and you don't end up prejudging before you get any fact, all the facts in. There are, you know, I work in a political environment. There are a number of members that are either out there saying, oh gosh, the president absolutely did it, or a number of others who are saying, you know, this is all, I haven't heard any actual Republican member of Congress use the terms that the president has used, calling it fake news or a witch hunt, but they're saying, you know, there's, may no be, there's no there there yet. Well, we haven't gone through that process. I think it's really important that uh, at least I do as much as possible to 
you know, play it straight, and then if we have, when we get the facts, give them to you. But could you imagine a world in which Putin suddenly becomes a Democrat and starts picking off Republican uh, House members, Senate senators, in their races? If and if if that happened, and um, people suddenly switched, that would be. That would be about as unpatriotic an effort as I could ever seen. I, I think most of us get that this is a real threat. That this is, you know, for people in politics, the notion, you know, you get plenty of folks saying good and bad things about you that may or may not be true. But the idea that a nation state is using its power and technology to try to create a totally false narrative that sometimes then has an echo chamber in this country that reinforces that, I think we all know that false narrative can turn on any of us. And I think that's why I think everybody realizes we've got to get this right. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of people wonder, given the publication by BuzzFeed in January of the dossier compiled by the former British spy that was used in uh, briefings um, over the winter, have you seen evidence that the president is personally compromised? I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to talk about the the dossier or anything, you know. I, I do this every day with all of the folks around Capitol Hill, where you basically got to give non-answers. We, you know, we got to. I think every bit of information has to be followed to its core to see, you know, if there's if there's smoke, if there is an actual fire. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think the American media can do better in future elections? I think, as I said, one level is the platform companies recognizing that, you know, that some of their algorithms that might allow a geographic targeting of information that's plain, just plain fake, that there may be a, ro a role of curation there. Some of them are starting to get more fact checkers, but there is a, there is a, a level of sophistication of the tools that these platform companies have you know, frankly, that's a whole other discussion, but it ought to scare the heck out of you. What they know and how they can, how they can use that information in ways that we may not even be aware of. It, you know, that is one of the next coming debates. And, and um, uh, frankly, the, the kind of the more traditional mainstream media from conservative to, li to liberal, um, they got to do a little more fact checking. You know, at, at some point, you know, in a world where we're overwhelmed with this much information, you know, figuring out who's going to be kind of the guardians on truth, you know, is something we got to, I think, is again, as a people, we have to sort through. But the media's got a responsible role to play in that as well. All right, I think we've... How about that for a little sobering on a uh, Friday <laughs> afternoon? Uh, we've uh, barreled through our Q&A time because uh, this was such an interesting conversation. But thank you all for coming. Thank you for your attention. Let me just, Thank you. Oh, oh, one last, one last thing. Wait, wait, wait. You know, one of the things that we can all do as Americans is call out BS. You know, when you just because somebody says they read it on the internet doesn't mean it's true. And what we need to do, all of us, again across the political spectrum, is realize. You know, we got to protect it. We got to get it right. And I think there are a lot of people in both parties in Washington who are committed to that. So thank you all very much. All right. Thank you so much.